Thomas, it is great to have you here it's in Rochester. Great to be here. Great. Well, let's start at the basics. Okay. I'm really curious, how did you get into conducting? Uh, what brought you into music? Um, I have wanted to be a conductor since I was eight years old. Um, I'm kind of the poster child for the value of having an orchestra in your community and music education in the public schools. Sure. Uh, I went with my third grade class. I lived in Norfolk, Virginia. And at that time it was the Norfolk Symphony, now it's the Virginia Symphony. Uh, I, I had no idea what an orchestra was. Um, and I saw this mass of humanity with instruments uh, in their hands. And the conductor came out and started to conduct. The orchestra stood up for the cellos and the, and the bassoons, and they played the Star Spangled Banner. Now, I had heard the Star Spangled Banner dozens of times as a young kid, but I had never heard it in the voice of this thing called the orchestra. And there was something about the proximity of this man, Russell Stanger was his name, uh, to all of this magnificent new sound that I was hearing that I thought, I looked at that guy and thought, that's where I want to be. Uh, and so I'm literally living my life's dream. You know, started violin the next year and cello the year after that, and, and um, you know, all these years later, I'm st I still get to do it. And now you're here. Yeah. Um, I, I read that you are actually the youth and family, family conductor, yeah. yes, of the Boston Symphony. Yeah. And it, it seems natural from your, your backstory that mm -hmm. you kind of, even how far you've come in your career, you still want to go back and... Mm -hmm. inspire people. Mm -hmm. Can you just talk a little bit about really that process of why you decided to do that? You know, it's funny that you said it because you would think, in fact, when they approached me about taking that position, it's an, actually an endowed chair. Okay. And, and, uh, and, and, but I'm only the third person in 55 years to hold that chair. Wow. Um, and it sat empty uh, for, for many years. Um, but when they approached me, I thought to myself, but this is the kind of job that a, a young up-and-coming conductor trying to learn the ropes, trying to learn repertoire, this is the kind of job that should be preserved for them. Sure. Uh, and they said, no, no, we, you are the person that we want for this. Uh, I had been there, I had done a week of those concerts with them as a guest conductor, and I debated it and de debated it for a while, and my wife said, but you love doing children's concerts, why would you not do this, you know? And uh, uh, but you're right. I mean, because of my backstory, um, uh, I, I understand in a very unique, not unique, but very deeply personal way how important it is to not just teach kids about music, but to use music as a way to teach kids about living their lives. And that's really where I come from with my family concert, so, and my, my education concert. So if I do a program about m pulse and meter and, and, and music, it really is about perseverance. If I do a program about uh, orchestration and how all the families work, it really is a, is a program about community and sure. team building. Um, and the result is kids and grown-ups get to walk away with a greater understanding of how we should respond to each other as human beings and how we should exist together in a community. Uh, and, and how we should live our own lives. You know, I say to kids all the time, wishing without working only leads to disappointment. So we, 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 we talk about things that are motivational things, but we talk about how, how is it that you can become a better human being? What are the steps that you need to take so that your life can sound like this, basically? Sure, sure. Well, that kind of brings a nice segue to uh, some other stuff I'm curious about. I know that you're also a music director of Omaha mm -hmm. Symphony right now. and as as a music director, you know you have your foot in two worlds here, mm -hmm. in in which in one you're responding with you know the children, mm -hmm. and I can tell you have a childlike wonder that you bring, <laughs> yeah. and and so that's natural to you. Right. But at the same time, you're working with mm -hmm. Omaha, and you need to bring in that audience as well, an older right. audience. And right. how do you balance those two worlds? Uh, you know, the reality is that I'm in three worlds. Oh. Uh, because I'm also the principal conductor of the Hollywood Bowl Orchestra. Okay. Um, and that's a whole nother world. I okay. 18,000 seat venue, cast of thousands on stage all the time. Sometimes it's rock and roll, sometimes it's pop, sometimes it's classical. That's you have three feet. I mean, it's like okay, uh, I'm, I see. I'm all, all over the place. However, for me, it's all the same. And it really is about um, our contact with the people sitting in the audience. It's just that we use different tools with different audiences. Um, sometimes we used to think in this business that we're always trying to convert people to mm -hmm. become classical music lovers. Well, some people don't want to be converted. They want to, they want to live in their jazz world. And my, I say to my orchestra in Omaha, let's be as many different things to as many different people as possible because we're capable of it. By its very nature, an orchestra is one of the most versatile instruments that we have in existence. 
all the different sounds, all the different possibilities of sounds, and all the different possibilities of, of, of kinds of music to play. We can do that all in an orchestra. And so we, 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 we reshape ourselves each week, always with the audience in mind. And so if, it, if we're playing Beethoven V, it's with a certain degree of integrity, musical integrity and intellectual integrity and personal integrity, I think, moral integrity for, for, for that matter. Yeah. But if the very next night we're doing, um, you know, Duke Ellington or, or whatever, the integrity has to be exactly the same. So there's, 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 there's just no difference. When I'm in one world, exactly the same. I treat kids like they're my colleagues. Uh, when I'm talking to an audience, I don't talk down to children. I talk to them like we're, like, like we're friends. Um, and I give kids the same repertoire that I give adults. So if you look at one of my family programs, it has Beethoven and Stravinsky and Shostakovich and Haydn and Mozart. Okay. Uh, they're, they're, they're all the same. Because I'm not worried about the music's ability to take care of itself. I'm only worried about how it gets delivered. And if any of the, in any of those instances, I put up a wall between us and the people in the audience, where there is no sense of community and, the, and, 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 uh, and a sense that we belong to each other and we are together sharing in this great musical experience, I'm not doing any of us a service. Sure, sure. Well, you, you kind of mentioned you have your foot in three worlds, but I was kind of just thinking right now, you actually have your foot kind of in four worlds uh -oh. because, because now you're, you're here and you're guest conducting. Right. <clears throat> and, and that is this, you come into a community that you might not necessarily know, mm -hmm. um, but you still have the same job of, of connecting. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, how do you really prepare for guest conducting? Because uh, that's different. You really have to learn a community. You know, it's funny because I, um, um, I, I was just having a conversation with someone that it's nice to be at this stage in my life where you're no longer trying to impress anyone anymore. Okay. You know? <laughs> um, uh, those days are over. I'm not trying to build a resume. I just want to make music. And, and so in regards to my relationship with the musicians, that's my approach. We just start off talking about things about the music and rehearsing things about the music. And sometimes I'll use language in a rehearsal that here's what I want the audience to feel at this moment, you know, mm -hmm. that, that kind of thing. And, and the idea is to display a sense of reverence for the music, that the music is much more important than I am. And so again, there's no wall built there that's I'm the maestro and you're the orchestra and you know this week I'm the, this, the whatever. It's, it's just not there. It is, yeah. can you believe we get to participate in this world? Of all the other things that there are out there to do, we get to participate in something that is greater than us, has always been greater than us, and will always be greater than us. And yet here we are. Uh, and once everyone in the room senses that dynamic, we all want the same thing. And it has nothing to do with me, and it has nothing to do with them, it has everything to do with that particular musical moment. And uh, we all walk away enriched as a, as a process, in, in the process. And, and I haven't tried to impress anyone, I haven't tried to be uh, an authoritarian over anyone. You know, it's just, it's not. And in regards to the community, sure. uh, you know, I've already had a white hot. That's, Good. So you're, I mean, you're, you're initiated. I, I, I know you're exactly here. what, yeah, oh man, the food. My wife always makes fun of me. She goes, everywhere you go, you have to figure out what the local food is. I said, I'm sorry, I just do. But uh, you know, I do things like I watch the local news because I want to know what, what things are important to a community. Sure. Um, I go to local places to eat, um, well, for obvious reasons. But uh, um, you know, it, it was funny me the other day going, What's a hot? <laughs> and then she says, well, hot. I went, yeah, I'll have one of those. Nice, nice. That's the way to be. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's go to some fun questions. Uh -oh. um, they were all fun so far. Oh, for, for me, sure. <laughs> um, you're a pretty inspirational guy, but mm -hmm. everyone was inspired at some point in their lives. Mm -hmm. Who were some of your greatest musical inspirations growing up? Uh, I think by the time I understood anything about music and about learning and about conducting. There were people like, who is still now a very good friend of mine, Leonard Slatkin. Okay. Um, uh, um, in Detroit right now? He's in Detroit right now. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, in fact, I, I was just with the National Symphony last week and, and he was the music director there for a while and his pictures mm -hmm. in the dressing room. And his pictures in the, in, the, in the hallway of my own concert hall in Omaha when this, from when the St. Louis Symphony was on tour many, many years ago. So I emailed him and said, 
what the heck? <laughs> You're following me. <laughs> he emailed back, it is my life's duty to haunt you in every venue you go to, you know? Uh, but but, but he, he knows that he was a great inspiration to me. And um, James DePriest was another. Okay. Bill Cosby, believe it or not, was one. Okay. And though it wasn't a musical inspiration, it was, it was a person who looked like me, but he was a great intellect. And, and, and everything he approached, he approached with this intellectual integrity. Uh, and so that was a great inspiration. And then, of course, it's impossible to have a list of influential people and not have a teacher on that list. And I've had you know, some great teachers who, uh, along the way, either smacked me upside the head, as they say in the <laughs> South, and said, you're not doing this right, or uh, you're doing this right, but you, you could do it so much better. Yeah. yeah. Wow. It's really amazing. Um, so my, my next question is, it's all about engaging with the audience, right? Mm -hmm. If someone is listening to classical music for the first time and you have to tell them just one thing to frame their mind or maybe not frame their mind, hmm. what would it be? Um, I talk to all of my audiences, um, regardless of what kind of program it is. Sometimes if the music requires explanation, I explain. Sometimes if the music requires an anecdotal setup of what was going on in the time of the life of this composer, I'll do that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes if I need to be funny, I'm funny. I don't know how, but it, it just works. <laughs> it just ends up working. It just happens. Yeah, it just happens. Um, and there are other times when I will say, um, here's what I think this is going on here. But I invite you to choose your own words for what you think is going on. Sure. And um, the most important thing is to always give them the impression that this music has something to say to them. That you don't need to know how many flats are in the key of B flat. You don't need to know how many con piano concertos Beethoven wrote. None of that stuff is important. Only the fact that you have two ears and a heart. Everything else will take care of itself. And seven of my favorite words is when um, someone comes to me backstage after a concert and says, oh my gosh, I had no idea. That's a great gift. And yeah. you know, that's, that's what music is. Yeah. Uh, that's what it always is. You know, James Taylor, when someone said, where, where do you get your ideas for your music uh, from? And he says, I don't really think I get the ideas from anywhere. I think I'm just the first guy that gets to hear the song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the power of music. Yeah, that, that's a really great way to put it. Well, you're conducting uh, Shostakovich, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What, what do you think? What do you? What frame of mind do you really take to Shostakovich uh, as a composer? Um, well, you know, this particular symphony was written right after Stalin died. Yes. And and he himself talks about how. Um, you know, he says, I'm not going to, basically, he says, I'm not going to apologize for writing a piece of music that describes this ugly phenomenon that we just lived in for the last, what, 30-some 30, 30 years, yes. 1922 to 1953, 54, for Stalin. Um, and um, so when, when you hear that music in the very beginning, for example, the fact that he gives us six notes and then a bar of emptiness. That piece hasn't even started yet. He's already stopped it. Um, and so in that instant, you, you sort of start to look over your shoulder because he just throws this giant question mark in the air, mm -hmm. um, you know? And then uh, he laments that he never was able to write this great symphonic allegro first movement, you know? Um, um, but yet in, in this music, which is mostly 99.99999% in three, four time, he manages to show us that whatever that question mark is, whether it's doubt that these Stalin years are over, and these are my words, whether it's doubt that freedom will ever really be achieved, again, my words, mm -hmm. whatever it is, it grows in its intensity inside of us. And all of this music, I mean, in, in the middle of that first move, movement, just, just almost like Beethoven 5, it, it, it's, just, it's just relentless in the first movement. And even when it surrenders and slows down, you're just exhausted 
when it slows down. So the notes get heavier and the and and the and, and, I, mean, I mean just weightier, not, not not so much more accent. They just they just feel like they the burden weighs more. Mm -hmm. um, and then in that second movement, he shows us he shows us his portrait of Stalin. That fast music quarter note equals one seventy six. He says oh, never okay. stops moving, and it's forte or fortissimo for most of the period, except for one piano that only goes back to a crescendo to triple forte, which is, you know, it's like, I'll, I'll give you a piano, but it's not gonna last We're going up. And it's going, yeah. Uh, so again, at the end of that second movie, you're like, oh my gosh, you know, uh, that. In the third movie, he gives you what one writer said, it, it's, it's like someone peeking around the corner, is it safe to come out yet? You know, this delightful little, uh, uh, there's almost this, you know, the corners of the mouth going up in the third movement. It's just terrific music. Um, uh, and then he finally, at, in, in, in the last moment, he, he just, he's happy in the, in the last moment. Someone called it a, uh, what, what they call it, a um, optimistic tragedy, I guess is what they, so uh, for me, in a sense, all of that goes into my head as I start to ponder how the musical phrases should be spoken. Uh, and, and especially in that first movement, which is the longest of all of them, um, uh, and and it's the easiest note values in that first movement, but it's the hardest movement in the piece, because you have, for me anyway, you have to find just the right pacing so that all of that sort of sameness doesn't wear down, uh, because it's really not sameness. Yeah. Um, it's funny because I, when I'm conducting that piece, I think to myself, oh man, I can't wait till I'm. 65 and come back to this piece that had, had lived more of life and think differently about things. I wonder what this is going to be, like, what, what this music is going to feel like. Yeah. I'm, in, I'm in no rush to get to 65, but, but, <laughs> I, but still, uh, you know, um, so I mean, all, all of that comes into play. Great. Well, I absolutely can't wait to see the performance, and it has been a pleasure having you here. Great. Thank you so much, sir. My pleasure. It's been great.